My name's Leon. I help lead engineering at a nonprofit in town called Resilient Coders. What we do is take traditionally underserved youth, we teach them how to code through an eight week boot camp, and then we bring them into our digital agency. Right? So we do an agency that does primarily web development and design for corporate clients around the Boston area. Our students come from our boot camp into that internship, we call it a technical fellowship, and they're with us from anywhere from two to six months really just learning the basics of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, going a little bit further and learning some CMSs, and now pushing into things like React. When I first started researching CSS modules and we were first kind of evaluating it for our agency, the one thing that kept coming up over and over again, any YouTube video you watch, anytime you mention to somebody that's been in the CSS game for a while, they go, oh my god, no, not another tool. So whenever you kind of say like a new tool, there's always kind of like the people that give pause. And so where I wanted to start was, let's kind of evaluate kind of like CSS. What are the good things? What are the bad things? Just a high level overview. And then we can start to think, are there better solutions to how we're writing our CSS? The good parts, CSS all day long, especially for our newer students, is easy to write, all right? You learn the basics of rules, you learn the basics of selectors, declaration blocks and declarations, and you're off to the races. You can do CSS pretty easily, especially compared to other languages that a newer developer would kind of have to learn and go through with. Right? One great thing is that you can have like this master style sheet. You have this one entity that will govern the design of an entire application. So it's super powerful, super easy to write right off the bat. And then we actually have some power in the terms of the cascade, right? You can make a few changes, have those changes go through the cascade, and with just a few modifications, completely change the design of your application. All kind of really good things, but can lead to some of the more troublesome parts of CSS, right? Hard to maintain. At the end of the day, you're trying to fix some sort of style, you're trying to update a style, and we've all been there just tacking on a few rules at the end of our style sheet, hoping to change something further up in our application, right? We just tack it on, Maybe we're using some importance where we shouldn't be using importance, right? And we kind of start to add and really stop trying to find the root cause of the issues that we're seeing, right? And we're always kind of having that difficulty of maybe just tapping some stuff on. Uh, over time, we have a lot of unused code, right? And especially at our agency, when we bring new individuals in and they're getting their first kind of toes wet in the new project, one of the big things for them is looking at some CSS, figuring out whether or not it's important to the project. Can they touch it? Can they modify it? Is it something that they should just leave alone? And we start to see over time some unused code that starts to grow and grow. Right? Now, there are definitely solutions to all these problems. There are definitely best practices to all these problems. But these are some of the things we see when folks are kind of starting to jump into the CSS space. Now, the other really big thing is collision. It's a global namespace, global style sheet. You're going to run into naming issues. If you have multiple developers working on the same project, they're probably gonna think of the same class names on different elements, right? So you're gonna wind up with multiple class names that are the same, and you're gonna start losing styles in certain parts of the application, or certain parts of your application are gonna be having different styles than you would expect. And so this idea of everything being globally scoped can lead to a really big problem, which is collisions. In 2014, uh, Christopher Trudeau gave a really excellent talk that kind of spun all of this off, right? This idea of really rethinking CSS and some of the ways that we could probably solve some of the bigger challenges. And this is probably like the most famous slide I've seen in CSS. It's been everywhere. All the blog posts reference it. And it's just basically all the things that he saw wrong with CSS or the problems that were coming up. And right at the top, that global namespace. Right? That's probably the biggest problem that as you start to see CSS at scale that you're gonna run into problems with. Right? And so the solution that he presented um, is one that I think anybody that grew up with CSS and HTML, like that fundamental rule, separation of concerns, you can't violate it. And so it's not really the same thing, but he said that CSS has fundamental flaws at scale that can be solved by writing styles in JavaScript. Right? And so you get a little bit of a pause until you start to kind of understand it more. 
And for some folks, there is like a sigh of relief. Yes, programmatic behaviors to our CSS, that'd be wonderful. Using JavaScript to solve some of these problems, wonderful, right? A good idea, right? And so I think after this talk, there was just an explosion of kind of just blog posts, people talking about different solutions, and we actually started to see quite a few, few solutions come into play, mainly solving the biggest problem that I think Christopher kind of talked about. And that was, as we have a global namespace, it leads to naming collisions, and it's just super, super easy. Like what I would convey to my students right off the bat is that it's super, super easy to declare class names that have already been defined. And so there are a couple solutions that came onto the scene to help solve that. We saw things like OCS, Suit CSS, and then probably the one that got the most traction definitely solved a lot of the original problems. This is probably my favorite example of showing block element modifier. It's by Glenn Mattern, and he has four buttons. We have a normal button, we have a disabled button, we have an error button, and an in progress button. And we're going to see a naming convention, right? So the solution to the problem of having classes that may have already been defined was a naming convention, right? So you were starting to see our style starting off with capital letters, hoping to avoid collisions. We have the modifier syntax, so we can see the different variants in the code base, right? And then the last thing that I always kind of think about when I look at them is that it works, but it's not for the lazy developer, right? There's a lot of cognitive muscle, in my opinion, cognitive effort to keep that naming discipline and keep that naming discipline going throughout your entire code base, especially as it gets larger and larger. Also, part of our onboarding process of you're bringing new people into that code base, keeping that naming convention gets harder. There are solutions to kind of check if it's being followed, but there has to be a way that is a little bit more programmatic and doesn't rely on the cognitive effort of a naming style. And so I think a lot of folks start to look, and as I was kind of doing more research on my CSS modules for us internally, uh, people start to mention as the web becomes more component-based and less static, are there just better tools than the naming conventions that we've been using to kind of solve some of these larger problems, right? And when I'm talking about a component, just a UI, uh, just a UI that's independent, usable pieces, right? And so as we start to think about this, are there better tools? And the first tool that really kind of checked all the boxes for me were CSS modules. And so if you go to the actual documentation, a CSS module is a CSS file in which all class names and animation names are scoped locally by default. And that big thing there is locally. Right? We've been used to dealing with CSS globally for so long that the locally by default is the big key there. Right? Now, the thing to remember about CSS modules and know about CSS modules is that it's not an official spec, it's not uh, an implementation in the browser, right? it's part of your build process. Right? You are going to use something like Webpack, Browserfy, Post CSS with plugins, to kind of have your HTML inside of your JavaScript pairing with CSS as a component and then getting something that's gonna be way more useful than kind of we've seen naming conventions go over before. The way I like to think about it, and I think this is kind of an easy way to kind of think about it, is that CSS modules allow you to kind of write scoped CSS kind of like how you have locally scoped variables and functions in JavaScript, right? That kind of makes sense, right? Those locally scoped variables in JavaScript, local to that function, same thing when we get to CSS modules. The CSS we're writing is local to that specific module or that file. And also, when we look at JavaScript and we look at like the best practices for JavaScript, like what's the number one like best practice we always see for JavaScript? And if you like Google it, it's always gonna show up as like, don't use global variables, right? And so like that, that kind of makes sense. Why aren't we doing it with our CSS? Like this is like the first thing we teach new JavaScript developers. Why isn't that kind of permeating into our CSS stuff? 
So let's take a look at an example, just so we can see how modules act and behave. Uh, regular HTML, just a section I've given in a class Zebra, just to show that there's no magic from the classes here. And then in our CSS, that Zebra class would have a background of red. Now, we would write a short piece of JavaScript, and this isn't kind of exactly what it would be, but the basics are here for us, okay? We are going to import from our style sheet, or we'll eventually learn to call it a module, uh, and we set up kind of like an object where we can then pull the class from that specific file. So when we see styles.zebra, we're actually pulling that zebra class that was in the original style.css. Now, we have a magical build step, whether it be Webpack or your choice. And what we wind up with is a separate HTML and a separate CSS that we can use that has a hash land on the end, right? So what we wind up with is a very unique class name that's both for our HTML and a very unique class name that's also for our CSS that is never going to repeat, right? There is never going to be any more collisions. You run your build step once and you don't have to worry about the global namespace anymore, right? Super simple, right? You just run this and now you have the styles that enable you to kind of also have some sort of naming convention too. Because we see the original file in which we got the style from. We see the class it was originally being pulled from. And now we have this hash on the end, which makes sure that there's no collisions. One thing I kept mentioning is a module. And when I refer to a CSS module, it's really just a file. It's really just that CSS file. So when you're writing CSS modules, you're going to have a bunch of CSS files, right? And then you can call that CSS file a module when you're going to be using it with a module compiler. And that's probably just going to be Webpack or post CSS with some plugins. Andrew Farmer put together probably what I think is the best visual that introduces the, the concept of how this all works. And basically the far left example here is a regular CSS file that goes through the compiler and comes out with modified class names. Right? And the great thing is that CSS doesn't have a concept of local scope, right? It's still, at the end of the day, like the browser is going to read the CSS and doesn't have local scope. But what we do is, by having the local scope in those individual files and coming out of the compiler, we now have that very unique class name that works in a global scope because it's never going to repeat, right? And it's not something we had to keep in our head. There's no naming convention we had to memorize. It just spits out the right HTML and the right CSS for us to use. Here's just a really clear example. You have a CSS module or cat.css file. Inside that file, we had the class of meow. It goes through the compiler and out comes the cat meow j3xk class, right? And so the class is actually kind of something you can follow along. We mentioned a little bit before. Cat would be the original file name or module. The meow would be the actual local class name, and then that j3xk is that hash that slides on the end. A little bit of fun with compose, which is just another way that you can kind of start pulling in multiple classes into one element. You can see that we have a main color class, and then a display class that composes main color. And when we actually pull in the display class, just like we did before, uh, we wind up with a class that references not only the display, but also the main color. You can also pull in from a separate, another module or a separate file uh, using the same compose. And then the one thing I, I kind of like to think about here is that them really isn't kind of like needed here anymore. Like we can have this idea of like, say using big class to mean something in one part of our application and then reuse that same big class somewhere else in another part of our application, and they can be using completely different things, right? So I could do, say, like big, which just increases font size in one part of my application, 
and then do big, which increases like margin and padding in another part of my application, and it wouldn't conflict. You'd wind up with separate class names like we see here. Some of the two tools that are probably most common right now are Webpack and Post CSS. Post CSS has some plugins. Webpack has a CSS loader that can enable you to get this type of code. In the slides that I've shared, there's also some starter code. I linked to one of the main examples, and then I also linked to a modified example, which just kind of simplifies everything. You're not looking at too much code. And here we can see kind of how it would work with a little bit of React magic here. So if you're actually able to go home and follow along with the example I gave you, npm install, npm start, and it will do everything for you. You're going to see Webpack run. You're going to see it kind of pull all these files together. It's going to pull that JavaScript file that's sitting next to the CSS file, and then it's going to output some HTML and CSS for you. And if you use the inspector, and you go into the inspector, you're going to see that convention, right? The, the where the module came from, the class in that module, and then the hash that's been tacked on to the end in both the CSS and the JavaScript. Sorry, both the CSS and the HTML. Right? So as long as you're thinking in terms of components, this gets really easy. Right? It's simply a CSS file and a JavaScript file. It goes through your compiler, and you get actual code that you can really, really use. Are CSS modules the future? Uh, I think CSS modules do some really good things for us. It's way, way faster development because you're not worried about the global scope anymore. Right? It's also way more maintainable. And you can actually configure your compiler to keep a naming convention as well. So it's really easy to see where parts are coming from, what module each piece of CSS is coming from. And then the last thing is that it removes a lot of the fear and a lot of the onboarding process because individuals know exactly where the CSS they're working on is going to have effect and they can jump into a code base without some monolithic CSS files or tons of CSS files that are coming together. When they want to work on a component or a piece of an application, they know exactly where to go. So for us and our students that are coming in and out, they're able to jump in and out without having that fear or complication where you run into a lot less errors. Now, there are some others that are kind of entering the space, especially for the fans of React in the room. We are seeing a lot of kind of like programmatically generated inline styles with things like Radium and Aphrodite. It's kind of new. I believe in the end that the CSS modules are great for larger teams where individuals are jumping in and out of different parts of the application. The inline styles play pretty nicely as well, but for us, CSS modules work, especially when we're not just always dealing with large-scale applications. We're also still kind of dealing with documents as well. Note that I'll put up there as well. Uh, every Tuesday and Thursday at 50 Milk Street, 3.30 to 6, we have lots of students that could really, really benefit from your help. We're always looking for folks that know HTML, CSS, things like React to come and help our students learn how to do more.